You know, if I preach about Mother's Day uh, on a Mother's Day sermon, you, you have to understand that I can't cover everything. Okay? You, you just have to understand that. Okay? And uh, that you'll probably, when I'm done here today, you'll probably say, he left this out, he left that out, he should have said this, he shouldn't have said that. And there he goes again, you know, doing whatever he does, you know. But it's Mother's Day. Don't be so, you know. Amen. Listen, hon, I have a very uh, important question to ask. And you better have the right answer. <laughs> Did the cookies arrive? I thank, thank you. I'm, I'm very appreciative that you stayed at the house and made sure. That, did the cooker lady find her way there just fine? Did she do okay? Good. Yeah, we, we appreciate her. We, we, we do. And I appreciate you, and we'll go out to lunch together, and I'll tell you once again how much I appreciate you, and you saved my life from the rest of the women at the church. So anyway, thank you. Anyway, so we're in 1 Samuel. I'm going to read not all of 1 Samuel chapter 1. I'll read a little bit out of chapter 2. I'll mention a little bit about chapter 3. Uh, and uh, uh, I should probably pray first, and uh, which is a, a good idea. Lord, thank you for you, and thank you that we have the opportunity to consider your word for a few minutes this morning. Um, as we, uh, we appreciate you and your presence, and we worship and honor you and extol you and... and uh, Find find our hope and our comfort and our security and our power and our grace and our forgiveness and the many blessings of life, your generosity. We find it over and over again. We are grateful. And we're thankful that you're here today with us. But we pray also, Lord, you'd help us uh, to honor mothers today. And uh, we pray that... Uh, You'd speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit, as we have this time together. And thank you for your word, Lord, that we have before us. Help us to be readers of it. Don't worry about how much, but that we do. And that we would consider what we read and what we hear, uh, that we would uh, uh, apply it to our lives as the need is, uh, with your help, Holy Spirit. But help us now and bless us, and may we hold on to something of this service, the entirety of this service, not, not just the preaching, but, but the entirety of this service, that, that there's something here for each one of us. Lord, you knew who was going to be here, and you, you know all about that as the services orchestrate to be together and what to do, what to sing, what to preach, and the ministry of each one that's here, their presence is ministry. We're grateful. Speak to our lives. Help us, please, now. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to look at 1 Samuel. We're going to, out of chapter 1, we're going to read verses 10 through 20. Okay, and you understand about 1 Samuel, and we get into this. This We're coming to the end of the time of the judges in the land of Israel before there were ever any kings. The time of the judges was, I think, about 350, 370 years or something. You know, the, the people got into the promised land and, uh, you know, they were looking for some leadership and some help. They got themselves in trouble quite frequently and they needed to be bailed out by God and God's man and God's prophets and things like that. And so uh, we call them judges. They weren't really kings. They provided some leadership. Some of them were prophetic and uh, some of them were priestly. And so we're, we're, we're coming to the conclusion of that as we get into the life of Samuel. Okay? And uh, Samuel's actually the last prophet in, in this fashion and, and priest and judge all kind of wrapped up into one. And he will anoint the first king of Israel, King Saul, as his life comes near to a conclusion. And so we're going to talk about 1 Samuel. Well, we're not going to talk about Samuel. You know a little bit about Samuel. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Hannah, who was Samuel's mother, who was Samuel's mother. And so uh, it, you have Samuel's father is Elkanah, and uh, you have also uh, another, another wife. This is a two-wife marriage. Okay, I'm Italian. I could say ay ay ay, you know, and Mamma Mia, and all that kind of thing, you know. 
and, and Jewish, I don't know any Hebrew, but I can at least say yikes, you know, that kind of thing. How's that, you know? And I think Pen Penina or Penina is her name, okay? And, uh, and so that you're aware of them as we're going to begin to read out of chapter 1 and verse 10. So the family is in Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was at and the uh, Ark of the Covenant and where they did their sacrifices then because this is before the kingdom per se and kings and Jerusalem and, uh, and, and eventually, you know, the temple built by Solomon and stuff like that. So. And uh, so they're there to worship and offer sacrifice and the family feast. And then again, you know, the national feast they were having. And but uh, talking about Hannah, verse 10, she was in bitterness of soul. And prayed unto the Lord and wept sore very much. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head, because he would, I guess, take the vows of a Nazarite and uh, not have his head, his hair cut on his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli, that's the high priest there at the time, marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial or, or somebody that's, that, that's, you know, no good against God, doesn't care about anything. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. And Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose in the morning early and worshipped, that's her family, and the other wife and her husband. And they rose in the morning and worshipped, and, and the other wife's children, because she had a lot of children, it says, had many, many sons. Okay. Early in the morning, they worshiped before the Lord, returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Now, what it says in verse 24, and I'm skipping a little bit, but you'll, you'll get the drift of things along the way. And when she had weaned him, that's Samuel, she took him up with her with three bullocks and an ephod of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young and slew, and they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also have I lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. He shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. And then after this, and we're not going to read it all, but Hannah prayed and praised the Lord. She's praying, and she, she said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. Probably talking about the other wife who had all those children. And Hannah was barren until the Lord miraculously blessed her, and she had Samuel. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, and there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions 
or weighed. And she goes on and on and on through chapter, through this chapter, talking about the attributes of God and praising him for what he has done for her. Then chapter 2 and verse 11. It says, and after this, because they were back where the tabernacle was at, and the, the, you know, and she brought young Samuel now, because he's weaned, and it's going to leave him there with Eli, the minister in the tabernacle to help Eli and 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 the learned ministry. And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, verse eleven, with the rest of the family. But the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Okay, verse eighteen. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, listen, and this, this is just touching. It, this is, moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year. So she's expanding that baby. I mean, making it bigger as he's growing, you know. When she came up with her husband to offer yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman. For the loan which is lent to the Lord, talking about Samuel, and they went unto their own house. Now listen to this. And the Lord visited Hannah, so she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. Okay. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. And then what you have in chapter 3 that I'm not going to read, you have the call of God comes upon Samuel's life. Personally, God does that, calls Samuel to ministry and service as he's a little bit older. And uh, along the way, if you read in that chapter, there's confirmation that, that this is so, that God has called Samuel into ministry and service. And there's also affirmation. You see that in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 3. And I'm just about done reading. 19 and 20, Samuel grew. Chapter 3, verse 19, and Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And then not only that, the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, and the Lord revealed himself to Samuel. Okay, this is the second time. Okay, by the word of the Lord. And I need to stop there. And eventually, like I said, Samuel becomes a prophet, priest, and the last judge of Israel. And since it's Mother's Day, and I should preach sort of like a Mother's Day sermon, right? Don't you? There's something, something, you know. Okay. okay. We're not going to talk about Samuel. We're going to talk about his mother. Okay. We're going to talk about Hannah. Like we said, she's in a two wife marriage. Okay. So it's not so wonderful. Not so wonderful. Okay. It's not so wise, and it's not so according to the word of God. Okay? However, in the ancient world, that was a common practice even by some of God's people. But it was never, it was never by design nor by command of God to have more than just one wife. Now, you think I'm going to joke around one wife's enough and all that kind of thing, but I'm not going to do that today. So take that. Okay? I'm not going to joke around. God's design is one woman, one man. Okay? You need to remember creation. Okay? It was Adam and Eve. Okay? And uh, remember that Adam said this and made declaration of this. I can't figure out how in the world he ever came up with this unless God didn't reveal it to him. He said, and a, and, and a man should leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. And there'll be one flesh. Okay? Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ also taught this, that listen, even though there was polygamy in the Old Testament, listen, listen, that, that's not what God intended. That's not God's design. It's not what he ordained. And Christ over and over again refers to marriage of uh, one man and one woman, one biological male, one biological woman. Okay. And not only that, the Apostle Paul repeats what basically what the Lord taught when he was here in his public ministry. Okay. Now you would think that Hannah's husband would do better 
than the culture because he's actually of the tribe of Levi. He's actually of the tribe where you get the, ple- the priestly line and uh, Levitical K okay, priesthood is there, but also the other ministers that help this, this, this whole, whole worship of God ministry of the nation to function. So I would think he would know more, maybe a little more of the word of God and more aware of things than maybe some other people about the things of God. And his lineage is priestly of the tribe of Levi, like I said. But he all does lead his family, we see in our text, like leads them in the Jewish faith and their practice and that kind of thing. And even the yearly sacrifices, he makes sure they're all there. And they're sincere and real about what they're doing. But if you read the beginning of chapter one, Penina or Penina has many children. Hannah has no children. And it seems the relationship between the two wives is, is not the best of situations. Okay. And it seems like from what, what Hannah says in her praise to God and prayer to God after Samuel is born and dedicated and is going to stay in Shiloh with Eli, it, it's how she words things, it, it seems like it, it, it seems like that, that Penina made sure that Hannah never forgot that Penina was the only one who was a mother of and to all the children that Elkanah, their husband, had at that particular time, the beginning of the chapter. Okay. And in the culture back then, and it's still in the Near East, okay, that culture cared about what? Honor and shame. And it seems like Penina, okay, from what Hannah says, or how she's perceiving this, is that the other wife was the one in honor, had an honor, and what we have with Hannah is shame because she was barren. Penina's at the place of honor, Hannah in the place of shame. So the home front conditions and situation even got in the way of some things. One, about her husband. It says, realizing she was barren and it looked like she wasn't going to be able to have children, but, you know, Elkanah loved, loved her too. You know, he, he, he showered her with more gifts than his other wife, not necessarily because he didn't care about his other wife, is because he realized the disparity here and the shame she bore and how hard she took it in her life and how in a place of honor his other wife was. So Hannah never recognized, didn't recognize the abundant goodness of her husband toward her, it says. Just didn't see it because of her sorrow about not having children. And the other thing also had gotten the way of Hannah experiencing the fullness of tabernacle worship and sacrifice and feast time at Shiloh. You know, just like you do sometimes. You come to church, but all in the family ain't just grand. And it affects you. And it bothers you. And the devil says, hey, you're a hypocrite. You're in church and your family's got grief and you're just a skunk this week. And listen, some of this is going on. You know, the family conditions aren't that great. Listen, with, with what's going on between the two wives and and, and it's got in the way of her experiencing the fullness of tabernacle worship, sacrifice, and feast time at Shiloh. Instead of, initially, when she's there now, instead of joy, instead of renewal, instead of happiness, there's bitterness of soul, it says in our verse 10. Verse 10. And we read the rest of the story in the text I, I shared with you. What took place, though, God did answer Hannah's prayer. Now, God's doing more with that prayer than Hannah ever realized. And God does that a lot of times, even in our prayers. We're praying for this and wondering when it's going to happen and how come this and that. And, you know, but God's, God's working things and orchestrating things according to his time and will and purpose. And a lot of times with us, even with answers to prayer, God's got other things going on, too. It's not just us. 
you know, and we need to cut him some slack once in a while. He knows what he's doing, you know. He's full of wisdom, and he sees the what? The end from the beginning, and he has purpose. The same thing with Hannah, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but about Hannah, she had a desperate passion, if I could say it so, a desperate passion to be a mother, to partner with being a wife to her husband. She did. And I put this in my notes. I said, good for her. And she, she got, it, got it right in the order of how it should be. We understand a lot of times it's not the case, but how it should be. She's a wife first, then wants to be the mother. Okay? Something else about Hannah, okay, is, is this, okay? Uh, she desired this, and I think it's good in her, in her desperate passion to be a mother, and good for her, she desired to be, uh, to, to help fulfill God's mandate of Genesis chapter one. Okay. Where God expressed the desire for mankind to what? To be what? Fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. I like that. Okay, that's right. You know, she she understood something, and maybe you know, I'm, I'm embellishing a little bit, so cut me a break. It's okay. Listen, she understood some things. Listen, the world needs more people, not less people. You've been told a lie about the world, and we got to stop this population explosion. It ain't exploding nowhere. In fact, the, the actual people that actually do the studying about those kind of things as the Earth's population is just about peaked and it will continue to go down now for a very long time because of the birth rates of Western civilization are crashing. Listen, the Earth needs more people, God said, not less people. And so she's fulfilling this. You know, the Earth welcomes more carbon footprints, not less. It does. And whether she knew it or not, okay, being carbon neutral, which she was before she had, uh, before she had Samuel being carbon neutral, you said she's carbon neutral. Yeah, that's, yeah. listen, is like near death sentence to planet Earth because CO2 is the lifeblood of all vegetation growth on planet Earth. And that's the fact of the matter. And anybody tells you anything different, man, they're, they're way off course. And we are so low beyond saturation point about CO2. Listen, uh, it, it doesn't even come to my mind if I live another 100 years. Or even beyond that. Okay. When you deplete the CO2 in the atmosphere, you're depleting the Earth's green resources and recovery and renewal. You are. You are. Because carbon dioxide is, is, the, is the breath of life to all vegetation. Did you know that? And I even failed eighth grade biology. I didn't fail. I got kicked out. And then my science courses when I was in high school, you know, I, I, you know, I just, you know, just like, you know, it's like other courses, you know, just like, you know. But I straightened up as, other, as the years went by. And I paid for it, you know, and I, I had to do some extra schooling and do some other things. Uh, not because I was necessarily stupid, just, just an idiot. You know, for a time. Okay. okay. So good for Hannah. She, she, she had a passion to be a mother. Her natural God-given biological, mental, and emotional desires craved to be fulfilled. And back then, it would also, if she had a child, remove the shame she felt. That it would then, that shame in having a child and being a mother, then that shame would turn to honor and praise as a wife and a mother, okay, for her husband. So I had had a desperate passion, okay, to be a mother. Not only that, Okay, and her desperation and passion to be a mother and in the bitterness of her soul. 
Because this isn't just like I want to have a kid as a trophy kid, you know, here I got a kid just like I got a new car and I got a boat and, you know, I got a, a, a vacation home and, you know, I got two dogs and I get, you know. That's not what this is about. The desperate passion to be a mother and in bitterness, she's praying. And she prayed for a child. She prayed for a child. Okay. With a promise, if you read a prayer, with a promise to God that she would lend him to the Lord for a lifetime if he would give her a child. Okay. Now, this didn't mean that she would stop being Samuel's mother. That's not what this means. Okay. But it did mean she would yield herself to the will of God being fulfilled in the child's life, whatever God wanted. And she was willing to, to allow him, after he was weaned, to, to be there at the tabernacle in help in ministry and service to the Lord. And you know what happened? Lo and behold, she winds up pregnant. And she's pregnant because she's the wife of her husband. And she's pregnant because she's a biological woman who has all these desires to be a mother. God answered her prayer. Here we have another miracle baby. There's a lot of those in the Bible. Did you know that? A lot of them, you know. Even that guy I like, you know, that guy John the Baptist, you know, he's a miracle, you know, you know, Zachariah and Elizabeth, they were they were old folks and had had that child, you know. And after she has has the son, then Hannah praises the Lord, and actually in chapter three, man, she's praising God and she's praying and she's preaching up a storm. She's preach up so she preaches a pretty good uh, sermon there about the attributes of God. And not only that, Hannah decides she's going to fulfill the promise she made to God when she was praying. Okay? Did you ever promise God anything? And, you know, you got where you wanted to be with, with the prayer, and you're like, you kind of like forgot about what you promised God you'd like do or be. Okay. Hannah fulfilled her promise to God. God heard her prayer, answered her prayer. She fulfills her promise. After weaning Samuel by bringing him, okay, her young son to be mentored and soon minister to and with the high priest Eli in the tabernacle duties at Shiloh. And her son will live there. And you see, she went every year and visited him. Now think how hard that must have been for her to do that. But she honored God. Now, you, that's I understand that's un, like sort of unusual, but but still, you you understand what is happening here. And eventually, Samuel, as he gets a little bit older, he's called by God personally. As he's resting on his bed at night, he hears the voice of God. God is calling him, and, and, and begins this this prophetic priestly ministry. Eventually, he will judge Israel. And along the way, you know, as Samuel begins to grow up, you know, Hannah has five more children along the way. How about that? So, and just think. Our day and age, sometimes we don't think like this, okay? But just think how blessed she was. Her mothering cup was filled and what? Running over. Running over. It's a lot of kids. And I thought to myself, okay, you guys want to come up, we're going to sing. Ain't God good? Ain't God good? Not only gave her her desire, but he blessed her with even more. Ain't God good? Isn't God generous? You know? She I, I tell you, I think this other part is because she fulfilled her promise to God. And God said, you know what? I'm going to honor you for keeping your word to me. And she had more children, not just Samuel. And I just think about all this. Isn't God full of wonder for this to happen like this? You know? 
Because you have to understand, more is going on here, and I know I need to close in just a minute or two. Listen, the more is going on here than what Hannah's realizing, because as time goes by, we, we can see what, when we look back now and we have the history of all this, we see God work, working and establishing Samuel, okay, that as the house of Eli, the high priest, will fall in battle to the Philistines because Eli's priestly sons were wicked, evil, full of iniquity, but they still did the priestly duties and Eli wouldn't fire them and kick them out. So Eli wound up dying, okay, and so did his sons in battle against the Philistines because God was, was, was removing them from their place, their place of honor and service because of what scoundrels they were, wretched people. Okay. You can read about that, what's going on for yourself, and actually preparing the next person to fulfill that void that would be there then, and it was the man, Samuel. Do you see God working more than just a, a, a woman's desire to have a child? Do you see this? God is orchestrating all these other things going on that I'm sure would never have been in Hannah's mind at the time she's praying for a child. Do you see how important, let's just say this, how important babies are? Okay. Think about it. You were once a baby. Except me. Right? My mother kept telling, always told Tony, you know, I was old when I was born. You know, so like, <laughs> whatever that means. You know, like maybe I came out smoking a cigar, you know, and having, having, you know, I don't know, pack of cigarettes in my diaper. I don't know. Who knows what, you know. But do you see what's going on here? So when God answers your prayers, remember, there's, there's probably more going on than what you think. And the timing has to be right, too, for God as he works these things out. Do you see how important babies are? You know, who's going to do this thing of what Samuel is, is made to be and how he develops and what God has for him in his plan if she doesn't want to have a child? Didn't have that desire, didn't have that passion. Who's going to do this? We need a baby born for this, don't we? You know, and you think about this, okay? I think this, I think Hannah, because of how she was, I think she lent her other kids to the Lord too. Not that she took them to the tabernacle and they had to live there, you know, as they grew up. I don't, I don't think that. But, but in her heart, Lord, whatever you want for my children, however you direct their life, listen, you know what's best. You go ahead and do that. And I'm going to be careful. I'm going to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and allow you to work in their life what you want and will and way in their life. That's what I think. Because I think about the other children that Hannah had, you know. Uh, they were babies too, and they had to grow up. And I thought about this, okay. Uh, they were not prophet and judges. They weren't. But, you know, babies grow up to fulfill all other kind of roles and responsibilities in life, don't they? Maybe some of Samuel's siblings, you know, maybe they were, uh, I have here, uh, um, maybe they were painters or plumbers. Maybe they were builders. Maybe they were butchers, bakers. Maybe, you know, about the candlestick makers. Maybe they were like that. Maybe they were doctors. Maybe somebody was a lawyer. Maybe uh, somebody was a tent maker. Somebody was a farmer. Okay. But God would use these children for his will and what he desired for their life. See, the thing that's most important with mom, that we, we want God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. Mom's life, child's life. You get that? So it, it, it matters. Babies matter. You think about the population we dismiss and we've gotten rid of, about 63 million babies. You think about all the scientists, all the doctors, all the ones that be world-renowned whatevers, 
that we need it. They're, no, they're not here. It's an honor to be a mother, no matter how you wind up being a mother. That baby is, is his own or her own person. And God has purpose and plan. So I like this story about Hannah. There's a lot more to Hannah than, than what initially meets the eye until you start reading this, studying, thinking about this. So God bless women who desire motherhood. It's a good thing. We need you, you know. God bless women who are mothers. He said, well, I know a mother that had just been no, yes, I understand, listen, there are mothers that are no good, I understand that, you know, and it's across the spectrum, and the same thing with fathers, I understand. I'm talking in generalities about, about motherhood is a good thing. God bless women who stand in the gap and mother children that, that need somebody that doesn't, they don't have anybody. And God bless mothers that do double duty because there's no father hanging around. There's no father being involved. That's a tough one. Now, I know, and uh, I, I don't want to like this, this about, you know, about anything about my mom, but, you know, that happened to us twice. My mom took care of us, you know, worked two jobs, walked to work. No welfare back in the early 60s or late 50s. And Linda Johnson didn't wreck the economy yet, you know. And God bless women who are like spiritual mothers to us. Boy, do we need that. Do you realize that mothers have this capacity to be more, more dominating and demanding and brother, you better tow the rope, but even about the things of God with mom than sometimes with dad. You know that. I know. I tried with my mom over and over again to get away with it. You know? But that's another story we have to stop. And thank God, last but not least, and the singer said, Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God. But thank God for Eve. Thank God for Eve. Without her, none of us would be here. You don't believe that. You're looking at me like you don't believe that. It is true. It is true. Absolutely true. You know, and Eve was not some subhuman like in the evolutionary development of things when God stepped in and poof, made them humans and they had babies. Thank God for Eve. Without her, none of us would be here. Adam said about Eve, he called her Eve because she was the mother of all living. Genesis 3, verse 20. Lord, I thank you what we've heard this morning. I pray that we would appreciate some of the, the, the good things about Hannah. Appreciate something else. Some of the good things of, of how, you, how you work in our lives and how important motherhood is and how important these little babies are and all the, this potential and the, the sanctity of their own lives, their little lives, and they have an opportunity to minister and love and care and help them fulfill their God-intended purpose in this world. I pray you help our mothers. Give them, give them grace, strength, Lord, give them courage, wisdom, insight. And, uh, and we understand, you know, nobody's perfect, but God bless our moms. We're not asking for perfection. We, we, here in this church, I don't think that's where, where, that's not where we're at. And probably all of us have some type of beef about mom, about something. But you know what? As we get older, we, we, ha we understand, you know. Everyone's got something going on, but, you know, they did the best they could with what they had. And sometimes it takes a lot of progress in all of our lives, the children too, 
to be what God would have us to be. So God bless our moms. Thank you for that mother. We think about Mary, you know, she had a little baby one time. Grew up, he was the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful she was willing to, to bear the pregnancy and bring forth the child. So we'd have the gift of eternal life. We're grateful. Let's sing.